Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Workers' Party online meeting, Anguish in America, as we discuss the recent events in America, the killing of George Floyd that have led to riots and protests, and the potential use of the military to repress these protests. We'll be hearing from George Galloway, and then we'll be in discussion with members of the Workers' Party of Britain. Over to you, George. Thank you uh, very much, Dan. Comrades and friends, thank you for watching. Whether you're watching right now on this baking hot uh, summer's evening, or you'll watch when the sun goes down, or over the next few days, uh, the audiences for these Tuesday night meetings is uh, extraordinarily impressive and interesting to us in the Workers' Party. And we hope uh, to recruit you. Uh, we want to educate you. We want to agitate you. We want to organize you. But we also want to recruit you because it's our position uh, that only uh, organized working class a party like ours can take our people uh, forward. This is uh, a momentous week. In fact, 2020 is turning into a most momentous year, and it's only not even uh, halfway through, or it is just exactly halfway through. And who knows what the rest of the year uh, will have in store for us. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the anguish in America, uh, but I want to set the scene uh, in a couple of important regards first. I want to uh, make this clear. You don't have to be black to be ruthlessly oppressed uh, by the capitalist state forces. These forces exist uh, to repress any existential threat to the power of our rulers. And I have lived uh, through uh, quite some uh, chapters uh, which illustrate that. But one of them I want to highlight is the situation of the yellow vests in France, uh, which for more than one year uh, were battling uh, the huge might of the French uh, forces of the ruling elite in France. And nobody, nobody in the liberal classes, in the Chatterati, in the Guardian or the Observer or the Independent or the BBC, nobody gave a toss for the overwhelmingly white working class people uh, who were being brutally assailed every time they stepped onto the streets of France, uh, which was uh, for a long time, every day and certainly every Saturday, uh, the tear gas uh, flew thickly. The rubber bullets, which are being highlighted now in the United States of America, were blinding uh, scores of people uh, on the streets of France. The broken bones, uh, the uh, eyelessness, uh, the uh, head injuries, and even the deaths of the yellow vest protesters in France uh, showed uh, that any challenge uh, to the power of the ruling class in France would be met uh, by overwhelming force, which is the purpose of these forces. They're not called forces uh, for nothing. Uh, and I don't make that point to uh, illustrate the hypocrisy of the Guardianistas uh, who are in anguish over America, uh, but were completely unmoved uh, about the working class people of France. That's not the reason I'm making that point, though of course it illustrates that. I'm making the point that you don't need to be black to be oppressed, repressed, and brutally quashed uh, by the uh, ruling elite and its system. And of course, it didn't just happen in France. I've lived a long life by the grace of God, and I lived uh, for a whole year uh, on the front line uh, of the minor strike of 1984-1985. Indeed, I'm an honorary member 
of the National Union of Mine Workers, South Wales area, Mardi Lodge. I was at the front uh, of brutal repression uh, by the British state forces of an overwhelmingly white working class uprising in defense of their families, their communities, their work, their livelihood. That's all the miners were demanding, the right to go underground and toil uh, at the coal phase. And because they were uh, prepared to defend their livelihood, their workplace, and the community in which it was situated, they were ruthlessly uh, treated and nowhere more so than at Orgreave, where over several days, the British state forces, uniformed and ununiformed, including military and special force and intelligence service infiltration, the British miners were bludgeoned, brutally bludgeoned, and none of them were black. Indeed, the pictures I saw last night coming out of Philadelphia uh, were a huge gang of white thugs uh, were roaming the streets with billy clubs and baseball bats, uh, took me back to uh, the uh, early days of uh, Jimmy Hoffa's leadership of the Teamsters Union, when the Teamsters were making their members uh, the best paid workers on the planet. Uh, they were regularly attacked uh, by these uh, billy clubs, these baseball bats, uh, by hired goons of the company. Indeed, all of the early struggles of the American working class uh, and the American trade unions, the IWW and other unions, including politically right-wing unions, but industrially militant unions, were overwhelmingly white working class people being brutally attacked by the forces of the state and their auxiliaries a point to which I shall return. But the United States, of course, is a special country in many ways. And one of its uh, specificities is its extraordinary ethnic complexity. Uh, the uh, presence in the United States of scores of millions of African-Americans, black people, uh, whose ancestors mainly uh, were dragged to the country in chains as slaves, usually on British ships, building up the wealth of the British bourgeoisie in Bristol, in Glasgow, in Liverpool, and in London, uh, out of the trade. The black people that were dragged to the United States and were enslaved as owned property, uh, the slave owners would make a an inventory of their assets, which would include uh, the, the number of cows that they had, the number of sheep, uh, and the number of slaves, uh, usually in that order. And of course, uh, these slaves uh, now have children who had children who had children. And although uh, the slave trade uh, was finally defeated with Lincoln's victory in the American Civil War, just before he turned the US cavalry uh, westwards uh, to go and complete the, uh, the uh, absolute genocide of the indigenous Native Americans. So don't imagine that the defeat of the slave trade was the end of the story. Uh, the, uh, the United States was built uh, in what is in otherwise a kind of Garden of Eden. Anyone who's traveled across the United States uh, would have to uh, concede uh, that this is the most breathtakingly beautiful subcontinent uh, of them all, uh, from sea to shining sea. Uh, it is uh, breathtaking. Uh, but this Garden of Eden, uh, because of how it was obtained and how it was built, uh, has been cursed uh, from the beginning uh, with the uh, scars uh, that we are seeing lividly exposed this week on the television. Uh, 
I know not all of you are religious believers, but uh, a country built on the original sins of slavery and uh, genocide uh, is not likely, uh, despite however many times they invoke the name of God, uh, to be much blessed uh, by the Almighty. And they have not been. The land has, uh, but their society has not been. And of course, uh, there are now uh, huge uh, communities of color in the United States, uh, above, way beyond uh, the number of African Americans in the country. It will not be that long before uh, Latino uh, people in the United States uh, constitute together with uh, the African Americans a majority in the state. And the racism uh, which has scarred the United States for centuries. Uh, shows no sign uh, of being defeated, as everyone watching, particularly on social media uh, today, can see. Uh, the freeing of the slaves by Lincoln and the victory of the Union forces in the United States Civil War, which was a truly gigantic uh, war, of course, with millions of casualties, uh, in many respects, a precursor to the First World War on the Western Front, a gigantic war uh, which further scarred America, was not the end of the story. Although the slaves were freed, uh, they lived lives of subjugation, of oppression, marginalization, super exploitation, and systematic discrimination, including uh, in uh, all aspects of civil rights. Uh, the uh, facts are uh, that Jim Crow, the segregationism uh, in the United States, uh, did not end uh, even in the United Sixties, uh, in 1960s, when it was officially uh, ended. But just get your head around that. In the 1960s, the swinging 60s, it was still not possible for well-known recording artists to uh, perform to unsegregated audiences. Uh, when uh, Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and their great friend Sammy Davis Jr. were performing uh, in ritzy hotels in Las Vegas, Sammy was not allowed to sleep in the same hotel as uh, Frank and Dean were. Imagine uh, that. And uh, the uh, discrimination, of course, did not end even when overt segregation ended. Uh, black people could uh, legally uh, piss in the same pot uh, as white people uh, by the end of the 1960s, but it would be viewed askance if they did. And the, what Malcolm X called the internal colonies uh, of the United States, the ghettos, uh, overwhelmingly populated by people of color, then black people, now black and Latino, and some of the Asian communities in the United States. Uh, continued as colonies. Super exploited, all workers are exploited, all workers in the United States are exploited, uh, but the workers of color overwhelmingly uh, occupy the uh, lowest order of employment, paid the least with the uh, least secure uh, terms of employment, and discriminated against at every level. Uh, not the least of which is at the level of internal security in the state. And this is not a new thing either. Believe it or not, on this day, 89 years ago, that is to say, in the lifetime of at least one man watching this tonight uh, that I know of, 89 years ago uh, today, uh, the Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, was overwhelmed uh, by white racist gangs with the overt uh, support of the police who stood by and allowed it to happen. Tulsa, Oklahoma, 89 years ago, uh, was a kind of New York City. It was booming. That's why the area was called the Black Wall Street, it was filled with successful black businesses. A black middle class was emerging, and that was the problem that could not be countenance and 200 black people were murdered that day, 89 years ago. And the uh, 
businesses were of course burned to the ground, uh, the scorched earth being all that remained. And of course, but for Bob Dylan, uh, we, we would never have heard of Emmett Till on this side of the Atlantic, Emmett Till, uh, a young boy uh, in 1955, the year after I was born, uh, who was lynched in a barn and uh, thrown uh, into, the, into a southern sea, his life's blood staining it red. And his crime was looking at a white girl. Uh, but for Bob Dylan, we'd never have heard of poor Hattie Carroll, uh, slain uh, by William Zanzinger uh, with his diamond-tipped cane that he hurled down the table and killed her. Uh, but for uh, Bob Dylan, we'd never have heard of Reuben Hurricane Carter, falsely uh, incarcerated, uh, uh, fitted up uh, in New Jersey, uh, in Patterson. Uh, but of course, we don't need to wait for a troubadour uh, to write songs now. As Will Smith put it, uh, I thought very brilliantly just the other day, uh, racism's not rising, it's being filmed. And that is the key difference uh, from the era of Emmett Till, from the era of poor Hattie Carroll, from the era even of Reuben Hurricane Carter. Now every move uh, that is made is being filmed. And my goodness, what a week it has been. I've just been, as I am every night, interviewed on American television, on RT America. And I made this point uh, that the videos of the hideous uh, violence being uh, dished out by the American police, National Guard, state troopers is now being filmed and shown and racking up 30, 40, 50 million views. And I've just seen one in Texas, uh, which will uh, startle you even in the uh, teeth of what you've seen uh, this week, a 16 year old boy shot dead in the head by a sniper uh, whilst uh, standing peacefully uh, protesting uh, a good distance uh, from the security forces. These videos, the fact that racism is now being filmed uh, is uh, changing the terms of engagement and has moved uh, masses in the United States. Uh, masses of all colors, by the way. And that's a significant new development. Uh, in the 1960s, the struggle against Jim Crow segregation uh, was uh, really the province of black people and white Jews, communists and leftists. Uh, the mass of the uh, people who were doing the protesting in Montgomery, Alabama, and uh, ag against the, uh, the Jim Crow uh, laws then in place, uh, did not contain many white people who were not Jewish, who were not communists. And at that time, those two things uh, were uh, almost a synonym uh, in the United States of America. That has changed, sadly, uh, for the worse, but for the better, uh, the young people of America, of all colors, have mobilized in their millions uh, this week uh, since the lynching of George Floyd. Of course, some of these uh, events have turned extremely ugly. Uh, I'm and the Workers' Party are against riots. Riots go up like a rocket, but they come down uh, like a burnt stick. Uh, they do not advance the cause uh, of uh, working class unity and transformative uh, politics. Indeed, they empower uh, reaction. And I'll come to that also in just a minute. Uh, but it must be uh, said, and this is not a conspiracy theory, there's plenty uh, on the internet uh, where you can actually see it happening. Uh, there's undoubtedly uh, far right and police provocateurs at work uh, on these demonstrations uh, to strengthen the hand of the right, to strengthen the hand of reaction, uh, piles of bricks being handily left uh, for no apparent reason uh, for uh, people to throw through the windows of uh, department stores and the rest. Uh, the uh, rioters who are 
attacking small businesses and, and uh, beating their owners who try to defend them, uh, the rioters whose purpose is to get a new pair of Nike trainers. That's not where it's at and sets the movement back. Uh, but the vast majority, vast majority of the people out on the streets in the United States are not there to grab a pair of Nike trainers through a broken window. They are there to confront the racism, injustice, inequality uh, of life for the mass of the people in the internal colonies that Malcolm spoke about, but also uh, right across America. In parenthesis, it needs to be said this. Half of all Americans, half, 50% of all Americans are either officially living in poverty or a category called near poverty, uh, which when you analyze what they mean by near poverty is poverty itself. Half of all Americans could not survive a $400 emergency, that's a 300 pound emergency, neither on cash or on credit. They could not muster $400 in credit, half of all Americans. A hundred million Americans now have no health insurance. The 70 million that never had it added to by the mass unemployment, uh, which now exists amongst all uh, ethnic racial groups in the United States. We're talking about a country where half of the people are living in poverty and where not 1%, but 0.1% of people live in lives of gilded luxury, almost impossible uh, to believe. In the Hamptons, in, in Beverly Hills, in, in parts of Manhattan and other extremely wealthy places in the United States. 0.1% of the American population lives lives of unimaginable luxury, whilst half of the people live lives of absolute uh, poverty. Now, this moment that we have arrived at and the reason for uh, this meeting being on this subject uh, this evening is that all the conditions uh, which would be required for the introduction of fascism in the United States are now present in the current situation. That's not to say that the United States is now a fascist country. It is not. But all of the conditions for fascism are now present. And the American working class, Americans who think like us, uh, people on the left, socialists, communists, revolutionary people, must wake up to the fact uh, that the terms of everything changed uh, with the conduct of President Trump last evening in Washington, D.C., when to the clear sound of gunfire and the thunder of mounted police hooves, the president announced uh, the militarization uh, of his own country. And this has caused a great shock uh, around the United States, indeed around the world, which is a little bit surprising because the United States has been militarizing other people's countries for almost every year that it has existed. As I said on Moats the other night, 97% of the years of the existence of the United States of America it has been at war somewhere in the world. And now they're at war with their own people. Uh, Trump's statement was blatantly illegal, blatantly unconstitutional. Uh, not in Washington. He has the power uh, to deploy the military in Washington because uh, they refuse to make Washington, D.C. a state uh, precisely because it has a black majority, a sizable black majority. Uh, so Trump can do what he likes in Washington, D.C., but he cannot send uh, the United States Armed Forces into Illinois or into Michigan 
he has no power to do that. But last night, he openly stated that he would uh, do that. And the deafening silence from the Democrats who control these states like Illinois, uh, like Michigan, uh, like New York State, like so many others, deafening silence from the Democratic Party uh, seems to me to indicate that they will find no real opposition uh, from the Democrats. And so the uh, possibility uh, now exists, whether Trump follows through on it, we'll have to wait and see, uh, that the uh, armed forces of the United States, the Marines, that's what we're talking about, will be deployed on the streets of American states uh, that refuse to call up the National Guard, refuse to uh, militarize the already tinderbox situation uh, that they have in their states, uh, the president will do it for them. He will dominate uh, the streets. That's what he said. And he said he would do it with the United States military. Now, of course, uh, legal action would be mounted, but the uh, pace of justice is no faster in the United States uh, than it is here. And the presidential election is fast approaching. And that's one of the reasons why Trump is acting as he is. He has seen a moment uh, to militarize the streets, to create an us and them dichotomy. He sees the Democrats paralyzed like rabbits in the headlights on the highway, uh, unable to decide which way to go, to side with the people or to side with the, uh, with the president and his uh, military adventure uh, for the first time since the U.S. Civil War 150 years or so ago. Uh, he has spotted an opportunity for a dichotomy which will benefit him in the uh, ballots if those ballots take place in November. And you should not rule out the possibility of those elections uh, being uh, postponed. Now, more controversially, and I'm not speaking for the Workers' Party on this, we have no view on it, we have had no uh, possibility to reach a view on it. But I know many of you, uh, many liberals uh, around the country also, uh, hate the existence of the gun laws of the United States. The Second Amendment of the United States Constitution clearly gives the people the right to bear arms, uh, to bear arms and form well-organized militia uh, to resist tyranny, resist foreign tyranny, resist domestic uh, tyranny, resist the tyranny of a president of the United States who began to regard himself as an emperor, as a king. Now, I've never been as hostile to the right to bear arms, as most people on the left have been. But whether you were in the past or not, it is clear to me now uh, that if I was living in the United States, the last thing in the world I would do right now is lay down my arms. The last thing in the world I would do would be to allow a monopoly on armed force uh, to reside with Donald Trump or his auxiliaries, and those auxiliaries are real. You can find them easily enough with a few touches of the keyboard. You can find them uh, itching uh, to receive the green light from the president to take their automatic weapons down onto the street and to destroy uh, those who are protesting and those who are merely watching to destroy anyone who's not like them, who doesn't look like them, doesn't love like them, doesn't live like them. A massacre uh, could very easily happen in the United States in this febrile atmosphere. You saw a taste of it uh, in Michigan State in the Capitol building uh, when uh, heavily armed with automatic weapons, heavily armed men protesting about their need for a haircut against the lockdown, actually stormed the building 
uh, without a single tear gas canister being fired, without a single rubber bullet being deployed against them, uh, where the police did absolutely nothing as mobs of armed white men stormed the uh, government building in the state of Michigan, causing uh, the governor to flee uh, from the building and hide in a safe room in the uh, building. Uh, these people haven't gone away, you know, and there are millions of these people in the United States and they are all heavily armed. Uh, so if it was me, I'd be making sure that me and my family were also armed. The Second Amendment doesn't just give the right to the right to bear arms. It gives the right to all American citizens to bear arms. Now, I, I never imagined I'd be talking like this, uh, but the situation that has developed overnight uh, makes it impossible uh, to address the current situation without honestly evaluating all of the possibilities. It is a very dangerous moment in the United States of America. The idea uh, that the United States is the leader of the free world is an idea that now lies a smoking ruin. In the last 12 months, the British press used that phrase 1,515 times, that America was the leader of the free world. Who would say it today? Nobody. No one in the right mind would so describe the United States today. The United States soft power has been utterly devastated by the events of the last week. The idea that anyone anywhere else in the world wants to be like the United States of America is utterly risible. That anyone anywhere in the world is looking to make their country more like the United States, again, absolutely risible, laughable, if it was not so tragic. And so finally, the idea dies uh, that the United States of all people has the right to police the rest of the world when it cannot police its own streets uh, without gunning down innocent, unarmed, peaceful people. And where black bodies continue to twist like strange fruit, not just from southern trees, uh, but on the streets of Minneapolis too. Thanks very much for listening. I'm happy to take questions or listen to contributions from the members on Zoom. Thank you very much indeed, Dan. Thank you, George. Well, we certainly have a lot of uh, questions and comments coming in from the membership. It's obviously a topic that's inspired uh, a lot of uh, thought and outrage and emotion. So let's see, uh, Fran. Go ahead, Fran. Evening, George. Um, first, I wanted to say, um, the party has solidarity with uh, everybody protesting in America. But also, my point to you is, do you believe that the USA has overstretched itself like in the last 20 years since Iraq? They failed in Iraq, they failed in Syria, they failed in Venezuela, they're failing in Hong Kong. Uh, and my second point is, do you think that this is like the USA's Tiananmen moment and that we shouldn't forget what is going on? We've got miles of propaganda for years to come out of all this. Um, that's my point for you to answer, George. Yeah, thanks, uh, Fran. Uh, there is no general currently serving in the United States Armed Forces who's ever won a war, uh, has ever been on the winning side uh, in a war. Uh, Chairman Mao was premature uh, when he described the United States as a paper tiger. Uh, it's not even now uh, a paper tiger, uh, but it is a dying tiger. Uh, the United States empire uh, has failed utterly to impose its will in one theater after another, decade after decade. Uh, and that's not going to change anytime soon. As I uh, used to say at the time of the Iraq war, uh, in one street alone, one street, a street I happen to know well, 
uh, uh, Haifa Street in Baghdad. 220 American soldiers lost their lives in that street. And uh, by the time the Americans scuttled out of Iraq under fire, uh, no American soldier had set foot in Haifa Street uh, for several years. Uh, the war on Iraq was launched to terrify the world uh, with American power, uh, but it achieved the precise opposite. It actually uh, showed the world that actually there was nothing to be terrified of. That while the United States had overwhelming power in the sky, it could not put American boots on the ground anywhere and prevail. Uh, because the American soldiers were fighting for pay, not for anything uh, more than that. And so uh, the American empire is undoubtedly dying. And that's one of the reasons why it's come home, <laughs> if you like, it's come home to die. Uh, the last battle front uh, is the internal uh, battle front. Uh, I think in the short term, it will probably benefit Trump uh, in the elections in November. I happen to think he was uh, scheduled to win those anyway. Uh, but in the medium term, uh, it, will, uh, it will hasten the demise of the American empire. Thanks, George. And um, we have a question from Helen. Hi, Helen. Hi, George. Um, yeah. Um, you've, I've heard you say before that when America sneezes, the rest of the world gets flu. Um, and it, it's good to see that, you know, there's been support in, in different parts of the world for these uh, people that, that are rising up in America, if that's what you'd call it. Um, do you think it's time for a, a global uprising of the oppressed? And the you know the working classes, the downtrodden, um, both from the West and obviously, I mean, there's a lot of it going on in Eastern, in Middle Eastern countries anyway. But um, is it time the West started to um, rise against uh, tyranny as well? Well, the, there are very few countries in the world, unfortunately ours is one of the very few, uh, where there is not a substantial challenge going on uh, to the prevailing uh, orthodoxy, uh, to the uh, power. Uh, and there are very few continents uh, where that's not happening. Uh, every uh, place and every time is specific uh, to its own conditions, of course, and it's not for us to uh, laid down uh, schema for other people. Uh, but we think uh, that the uh, political approach of seeking to unite the working class people on the basis of class is the best, uh, certainly for us. It might not be applicable everywhere at all times, but for us, uh, the patient building of a clear working class perspective and politics which unite rather than divide uh, the working people of the country uh, is the way forward. I wouldn't call it an uprising. My door would probably get kicked in and I'd be dragged off to jail uh, uh, live on, uh, on Zoom. Uh, if I did, it's not an uprising as such. Uh, we are working within the uh, parameters of the law and our a democracy here in this country. And there's a lot can be achieved uh, within those parameters. Uh, if, uh, if the ultimate goal could not be achieved, that would be a matter for the ruling class and not for us. Uh, we believe in the democratic uh, politics of working class unity. And somewhat ironic, though, you mentioned uprising, but uh, Trump called on Twitter only a few weeks ago for uh, governors of U.S. states to rise up against the federal government. Um, yes, Liberate Minnesota was one of them. <laughs> he, he tweeted in capital letters, Liberate Minnesota, uh, Liberate Michigan, Liberate uh, um, Pennsylvania. 
And what he meant was, these are all dog whistles. What he meant was, get your guns and get out on the street. Show them uh, the power that we have, uh, a power which we'll not be afraid to use. And our next question comes from uh, Sophia. Go ahead, Sophia. Oh, Hello, can you hear me? There we go. I can, I can, Sophia, thanks. Oh, you've been muted. <laughs> Try again, Sophia. Try again. Okay, right. Um, hi, George. How are you doing? <laughs> Good. Nice to see you again, Sophia. Good. Um, yeah, the the protests are shattering the illusion of democracy in the US, and um, I feel many people are waking up. Um, we live in such an individualistic, capitalist society where we, we worship celebrities, and by celebrities, I also mean, you know, politicians, members of Congress, Bernie Sanders, AOC, Jeremy Corbyn, for example. And we kind of expect them to save us, um, but they have a seat at the table and they're telling people to go home. And those people, a lot of people don't have homes and certainly won't have homes after this pandemic. They're telling people to vote and they've already voted for a Democrat. They've already voted for a black man. And what did that president do? He, how did he respond to the protests of the Native Americans at the Dakota Pipeline? Um, how did he respond to the poisoning of the people in Flint? You can go on with the bombings in Libya. Um, it just doesn't matter who you vote for. And I know the liberals are throttling at the mouth at Trump. Yes, he is a fascist. Yes, he's awful. Um, but it doesn't matter who you vote for under this capitalist system, which is inherently racist, whether it's for-profit prisons, uh, reg regime change wars. Um, we you know, we, um, we're not free under it, um, and we never will be. And we need to make sure that we, the true revolutionaries, are going to come from the working class. And I feel for that, we need to, we need to learn, and we need to unlearn, because I'm sure there's lots of people that will agree and have the same experience. But at school, my education of the civil, civil rights movement in America was um, Rosa Parks, um, Martin Luther King, who was very, very peaceful, um, and a little bit of Malcolm X, but he was, and the Black Panthers, basically a terrorist organization. And that was it, closed book. And that goes for uh, the revisionism of the Soviet Union. You can go on, it's a, it's a whitewashing of history. And so I think we all need to make a conscious effort to, to, to learn. Um, which has been actually really refreshing since joining the Workers' Party. We've had these meetings, people have reached out, we've, people have shared books and theory. And so the question really is, um, how do we put these ideas and theories that we're all sharing into direct action? Um, you say writing isn't the right way to go. What is the right way to go about things? Um, people feel that the destruction of capital is the only way to destroy capitalism at, at this current time. Um, what would you say would be the best approach, George? Well, first of all, that's a really outstanding uh, contribution and shows the level uh, of the cadre that we are building uh, in the Workers' Party. And I hope many thousands of people see and hear that uh, contribution. Uh, as Malcolm said, uh, getting a seat at the table is no guarantee that you'll get fed. Uh, you might actually be at the table as a waiter. Uh, and that's exactly what uh, some of these celebrities uh, that you mention uh, are. Uh, they are the dressing at the table, uh, but they're certainly not eating in the way that the uh, people who run the table are eating. And people like AOC talk left and act right. And that's true of the Democrats as a whole, but it's especially uh, true of the celebrity uh, squad uh, of Democrats, every single one of whom uh, has passed uh, Donald Trump's budget, has allowed uh, to pass his so-called security legislation. Even Bernie Sanders failed to turn up to vote uh, in a vote that could have been won uh, to uh, block 
uh, the renewal of the Obama era Donald Trump plus uh, security surveillance state uh, in the United States of America. Uh, Joe Biden was very clear uh, about the spirit of compromise that he represents. There's no need to shoot them in the heart. Why don't we shoot them in the leg? Uh, unarmed people, why don't we shoot them in the leg rather than the heart? And he thought that he was saying a good thing, uh, although I'm not sure he remembers it because I'm not sure he remembers anything after he has said uh, or done it. Uh, no, voting for uh, one or other of the cheeks of the same arse uh, will not achieve anything in the United States. As long as it's evil versus more evil, and in the case of Biden and Hillary Clinton before him, uh, that's actually debatable. Uh, either way, you're voting for evil. As long as the people of the United States are faced with that choice, uh, then the largest voting bloc in the United States, i.e. those who do not vote, uh, will continue to increase, continue to expand. Uh, what we need is a party of labor in America. Uh, we need a working class party in America. Uh, we need people uh, to get behind uh, a presidential candidate that is neither Tweedledee nor Tweedledum, and we need an end uh, to uh, that kind of uh, politics. Evil versus evil merely ensures that evil uh, triumphs. No, you're not destroying capital if you riot, Sophia. Uh, do you think uh, the, the looter can only steal that which he can carry, and Nike can uh, easily absorb? Uh, the uh, number of trainers carried out of their Manhattan store uh, will not make a scintilla of an impact uh, on their bottom line, not a scintilla. Uh, so destroying uh, shops and stealing trainers and designer clothes and so on uh, does nothing to advance the, uh, the struggle of the working class. Indeed, it makes it easier for reaction for the right to turn the masses against the rioters. Uh, that's not uh, the kind of politics that we uh, stand for. We believe in organizing people. We believe in agitating people, and we believe in educating people. And when we get out from this lockdown, and when we can do that out in the streets, that's what we'll be doing. Fantastic. Thanks, George. And thank you, Sophia, for that wonderful contribution. I'm just going to take this opportunity to speak on organising. We have uh, thousands of people watching the stream, actually, at the moment, who, if you want to come and get involved with this kind of politics, come and discuss with us. We're ha now having multiple, aside from this one, multiple organising meetings per week to come and discuss, educate, learn, as well as regional organising meetings online so we can hit the ground running once it's uh, safe to get back out on the streets and start organizing. So go to workerspartybritain.org, sign up and get involved. And uh, we have a couple of uh, questions that have been emailed in from members uh, who can't uh, join us tonight, unfortunately. Uh, the first comes from uh, David, who asks, um, as we are witnessing rage and fury, yet as yet unseen in the USA, to prevent the long existing racism in Britain to plunge us into the same devastation, how should a member of my minority ethnic background react if they were subjected to racism and unfair treatment in society or institutionally? And how should white fellow citizens react if they witness discrimination or racism against minorities? Well, first of all, this is uh, uh, not uh, uh, unprecedented at all. Uh, you're probably lucky that you weren't around in 1968. Uh, in 1968, in the riots uh, of 1968, the, uh, the amount of damage, the length of the struggle was far, far greater than this. At least uh, to date, uh, the, uh, the riots uh, on the uh, mother of Dr. Martin Luther King who, by the way, uh, should not be caricatured as, as, uh, as uh, some kind of uh, Boy Scout uh, 
uh, liberal uh, peacenik. Uh, he was not. Uh, he was uh, murdered in Atlanta because he was in Atlanta uh, to address the striking garbage workers uh, in Atlanta who were engaged in a mighty labor struggle. Uh, Dr. King was uh, beginning to synthesize uh, working class political demands, anti-Vietnam War political demands, and the demands of the black people in America. And that synthesis was uh, of potentially deadly force uh, for the ruling uh, elite in the United States, which is why they murdered him. Uh, and ditto uh, Malcolm. Uh, Malcolm could be tolerated as a slightly uh, zany uh, uh, so-called Muslim in, a, in a, a weird, actually non-Muslim sect. Uh, but when he became part of uh, mainstream Islam, when he abandoned the ideas of separatism uh, uh, at one stage campaigning for uh, black people in America to return to Africa uh, or to uh, have certain parts of the United States set aside for them as black uh, states uh, of the United States, when he discarded those things and began to concentrate on unity with the oppressed white people in the United States, and unity with the, uh, all religions and all the people oppressed in the United States, he too became a mortal threat. And that's why he was murdered. I'm, uh, I'm perfectly sure. Look, uh, racism exists in all societies, uh, but it's part of the armory uh, of capitalism. Uh, how else? do you maintain a situation uh, where millions, actually tens of millions of white people in America whose arse is hanging out of their trousers, who don't have two cents to rub together, how else do you keep them occupied from challenging the system that has left them bereft than by creating and pointing to across the railway tracks, a group of people even more poor and disadvantaged than them. By fixating poor whites with their marginally better situation than the poor blacks, you have succeeded in dividing and ruling both communities. We've even got it, look, I hate to digress, Dan, forgive me if this is uh, not a good digression, but it struck me there. Look at the poor working class Protestants in the North of Ireland. What has capitalism, imperialism ever done for them? All it, the only reason why it has maintained the allegiance of a big section of the so-called loyalist community is that they're not Catholics, they're not Irish, they're British. You've got Tom looking down on Dick, even though Tom's situation is, if it is utterly marginally better uh, than Dick. So racism exists in all societies. It's particularly dangerous in ours because the, the racists have power uh, and the victims have not. Uh, our society, American society, European society are all societies dominated by white people. White people have the power, including overwhelmingly uh, the power of force, the guns, the uniforms, so, of course, you can get a black racist, uh, but the black racist has no power. A white racist is quite likely to be in a position of uh, some power, and in the short term, at least, potentially deadly uh, power. So, anytime we encounter uh, racism, uh, we oppose it. Uh, we, we, we work relentlessly against it. 
uh, but we say to the minorities in Britain, there can be no salvation from what you have experienced under the capitalist system that we have because what happened to you is part and parcel of living in a capitalist society. And so liberalism, separatism, anarchism isn't going to solve your problem. Only by uniting with other people who are themselves oppressed or have risen against the system of oppression uh, can there be any salvation for you. That's what we believe. I think there was no need to uh, apologize for that digression. It's a fantastic point, well made. And uh, our next question comes from uh, Mara. Go ahead, Mara. Um, hi, George. That was a, that was a fantastic contribution, and um, I you, uh, want to um, ask several things, if I'm allowed. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, the uh, Black Lives uh, Matter movement is, is more inspiring than other movements because. Um, it uh, probably uh, erupts from a visceral fight for survival uh, in the sense that many other movements aren't because it's just not the same level of threat. When you fight for it because you fear being assassinated by the police, you've got more anger than when you fight because of, for, for the more abstract uh, purpose of uh, higher wages or other injustices, which are also important, but not as viscerally important as fighting for your life. So in that regard, I think that the Black Lives uh, Matter movement can be very inspiring. Of course, it has less inspiring in quite strategically disastrous mo uh, moments when it becomes riotous. But in fact, it has a potential for greatness, I find, because of the anger. But I, I, like you, I, I, I doubt that that um, anger can solidify into any uh, direction unless perhaps it unites with more movements. And I was, I was wondering, could we... Could we use the Yellow Vest movement and and um, and unite these movements together? And um, uh, I wanted to make an observation that uh, I think many people, especially on the left or people in Britain, uh, I'm not from Britain, um, I'm Romanian, so I've got a different perspective. But it feels like in, in on the British left, especially Labour, where I come from, um, it, there's an illusion that in fact racism nowadays and slavery and things like that are kind of in the past they still happen a little bit but they're not what they used to be well in fact it feels like in the new global system economic system that we're forced to participate there's probably more systematic industrial racism than ever and in my experience western mostly white people find it perfectly acceptable to uh buy things and partake in an economy and work for this economy where in fact Can you hear me, Dan? Oh, yeah, I think uh, Mara's connection has dropped there. Hopefully we can get her back in a minute. I don't know if you can uh, address the first part of her. Mara, are you back? Hi, I'm Mara. back. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure where it cut off, but uh, it, it feels like the, the, uh, the racism is so deeply embedded in the consumerism that we're forced to participate in. Um, it's actually larger than ever. I think there are more uh, uh, brown or colored or people of color in the world uh, slaving away to uh, give Westerners their luxuries than ever before. And that, that's why a movement like this one can actually be inspiring because it does hit at the core of the human injustice behind neoliberalism, which is that we feel that some people in Western Europe and the United States uh, deserve all the well, look, Dan, uh, just uh, because the connection is a bit shaky, uh, let, me, uh, let me reply to uh, the first part uh, of what Mara said. Uh, Kupla Cherry, I'm the only person uh, at the meeting tonight who's written a book in the Romanian language. Uh, I hope you read it. Uh, Mara, uh, thank you very much for, again, a really high quality uh, contribution. Uh, let me sum it up this way. Uh, I was talking the other night uh, to Governor Jesse Ventura, whom I very much hope still will run for president in November. Uh, and he was telling 
us about uh, a black friend of his in Minneapolis, who before he sets out in his car in the, uh, in the evenings, he puts his license, his insurance, his ID on a sticker suction point on the, the top of the dashboard of the car. He's black. Chances are he'll be pulled over. When he's pulled over, he'll be asked for his license, his insurance, his ID. And if he bends down to take these things out of the glove compartment, like you or I would routinely, the risk of him being shot by the police officer multiplies exponentially. So in order to avoid being shot dead for being black, he has these things readily available on the top of the dashboard. I don't know if you saw the video uh, the other night, uh, which ended with the incredible crime uh, that was visited on a black American woman called Sandra Bland, uh, who was pulled over by an armed policeman for failing to signal uh, when turning. Uh, into her own street. And she stood in her own garden on her own property, filming this police officer, pointing a gun at her over an alleged a traffic incident. The officer became so enraged that he handcuffed her. He took her to uh, the police station he locked her up in a cell uh, where she was found dead uh, some hours later. The early part, of course, captured on her own phone and her own video. That's the reality for the lives of black people in the United States. So that kind of super uh, suppression, oppression, supercharged oppression is, of course, only happening to uh, black people in America, but it also uh, happens elsewhere. I play a game with my wife when we are out driving late in the evening, seems like a long time ago now, uh, that if we see a car uh, pulled over, uh, particularly a nice looking car, uh, we play uh, the game of guessing uh, whether or not the driver is likely to be black. And of course, uh, they almost always are. So that's why you're right. The Black Lives Matter slogan idea is particularly powerful, visceral, as you put it, because it is literally existential. Black people take a risk every day in the United States of being killed for being black. And if you can't stand by, beside, along with, and be prepared to link arms with people who are oppressed on that scale in a so-called democratic country, a country that is so-called the leader of the free world, there's not much hope for winning you to any other cause. Uh, but you're right uh, about the reaction of many white people. I get every time I discuss the issue of slavery, I can count the seconds before I receive the incoming, and it can all be easily categorized. I know what they'll say. The Arabs began slavery. Uh, the African chiefs sold their slaves as if that made it better to buy them. If it's true uh, that black chiefs sold them, uh, and that uh, the last recourse well, I didn't benefit from slavery, so why should I make reparation uh, for it? Uh, but of course, even that isn't true, quite apart from that that isn't the point. Thanks, Mara. Great, great contribution. Shame about the um, internet connection, uh, but hopefully uh, next week uh, we'll be able to hear from you in full. A um, couple of uh, questions written in. Um, one from Gerard. 
how can we distinguish between those seeking justice and those opportunistically pushing their own agenda? And similarly, Rob Sutton has asked, um, the Democrats are definitely gaining from the situation. How much do you think they're capitalizing opportunistically? And how much, if any, do you think they're involved in stirring up tensions? Actually, I don't think the Democrats are gaining uh, from the situation. Uh, they'll be uh, blamed by the Trump uh, supporters in the United States uh, because they're not Trumpers. Uh, but they will not gain uh, the votes of black people whom they are busily betraying. Uh, black people are not going to vote for somebody who wants them shot in the leg rather than the heart. Uh, Joe Biden was struck dumb. Nancy Pelosi is still struck dumb. And the Democratic governors uh, across the United States are not just struck dumb. Uh, they're on Zoom right now uh, planning how to mobilize the military forces that Trump is instructing them to uh, to mobilize. Uh, so uh, I, I, I'm not sure what's meant by opportunistic uh, agendas. Uh, we have an agenda in the Workers' Party. Uh, we oppose specific acts of oppression, uh, but our agenda is to generalize from those specific acts of oppression, to uh, teach the people uh, that this did not happen by accident. It's not something that if you stick a plaster on here and there, uh, you're going to resolve uh, that these systems are, these problems are systemic and they flow ineluctably from uh, the uh, capitalist system, the globalized capitalist system, uh, and in particular imperialism. The United States learned how to uh, kill its uh, own people uh, by practicing on foreigners. Uh, the armed forces that Trump is going to send into the streets of Chicago uh, or Los Angeles are the same armed forces that have been practicing killing foreigners uh, over uh, the last decades. Uh, so this is imperialism and capitalism at work. And we have a responsibility to say so, because to do otherwise would be to deceive the people. It would be to say, well, if we could get better training uh, for police officers, or we could get uh, Jane Doe rather than John Doe in as mayor or police commissioner or governor. That's not where it's at. All of these people will in the end, including AOC, uh, will in the end uh, support the prevailing orthodoxy. They'll all be content with being in the room and maybe even being at the far end of the table, but well below the salt. Thank you, George. Uh, next, we have a question from Mark. Go ahead, Mark. Hi, George. Hi. Hi there. Um, so I've seen the, um, Donald Trump declaring that he may designate the Antifa um, a terrorist organization as such. Um, seen people saying that this could be a precursor to condemning anyone as Antifa um, and leading to show trials and um, just anyone that's in the way of the government uh, causing a problem to, to declare them as such. Um, I was just wondering if you thought this is this is something that was likely. Um, myself, I would declare myself a, an Antifa and it's not something that I ever expected any kind of Western leader to be saying um, that they'd be going after. Yeah, well, uh, both of my grandfathers uh, fought for six years against uh, fascism in the Second World War. I guess they would have described themselves as anti-fascists. Uh, I don't... I, you see, as far as I know, this Antifa is not an organization anyway. So if something isn't an organization, I'm not sure how you can proscribe it. It doesn't, I'm told, uh, have leaders. Uh, so I'm not sure how you can arrest the leaders of something that doesn't exist and who are not leaders. Uh, it's a typical Trump uh, eruption and helps polarize the situation. Uh, but if, if you're seriously going to prosecute people for being anti-fascists, well, 
the United States Armed Forces made a very major contribution, not as major as Hollywood uh, would have you believe, but a major contribution to the defeat of fascism. It's an absurd uh, idea uh, to criminal anti-fascism. Having said which, uh, and some might not like this point, uh, it is important to conduct anti-fascist activity in a way that does not increase support for the fascists. And we've touched this uh, a little bit over the last few years in relation to Brexit, in relation to uh, Nigel Farage and so on. You see, if you call everybody to the right of you a racist, and if you call every racist a fascist, and if you take the view that the only good fascist is a dead fascist, uh, then the logic of that stream is that you go around uh, killing people uh, because they're to the right of you. And I've seen, I think, some of that in the activities of some of uh, the anti-fascist activists in the United States. And of course, we would, as a workers' party, strongly oppose that. Every person to the, race to, to the right of you is not a racist, and every racist is not a fascist, and every fascist uh, is not somebody that we need to go out and kill. Uh, that is not the way to uh, address this issue. Uh, on the contrary, it inflates support for uh, the very political forces uh, to which you are opposed, and I think that that is a difference. Uh, between our approach and the approach of some others. Thank you, George. Uh, we have a question uh, on a similar vein from Matt. Matthew, go ahead. Uh, really, to be honest, in some ways, the question's already been answered, but uh, what, what is George's feelings about uh, UKIP showing solidarity with the, the terrible murder of George Floyd um, in the sense that... Uh, in the media, at least, uh, UKIP is perceived as an ultra-libertarian, right-wing, Thatcherite political movement. Well, I, I, I really don't know uh, about that, Mark. Uh, you've caught me blindsided. Uh, I didn't know if uh, UKIP were still alive, actually. Uh, maybe someone's hacked their Twitter account uh, if they're weighing in on the side of Black Lives Matter. Uh, that is a distinct uh, possibility. Uh, I'd, I'd need uh, further and better particulars on that one. Thanks, George. And we come to our next question from uh, Yusuf. Go ahead, Yusuf. Uh, good evening, uh, comrades, learned colleagues, and good evening, George. Um, I am... Uh, um, probably, I've been a Workers' Party member for a couple of months and I've probably started my re-education within the last year or two. And uh, and I probably only share a couple of things in common with you, George. Um, we're both Scots living in London. Uh, we both wear glasses and we both have a, have a thing for hats, so, although I don't have mine on at the moment. But hopefully as the years progress, I can share some of your values and, and also more importantly, live up to some of the some of the comments, uh, messages, ideas, and rhetoric that you hold. So that's that's my vision is to 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 follow some of the the pathways that you're leading us down. Um, it's important that uh, focusing on this matter to show our angst uh, and heartache at what's happening in America just now. Although we're not blinded to the, to the fact that there's nothing new here, but it's important to always acknowledge. The, the the issues that, that are at hand. My question is probably around more UK centric, and as you as you can imagine, uh, uh, that the the rhetoric that the liberal class, the mainstream media, the political class is showing in terms of showing their solidarity with a hashtag and in the right terminology, it's it's perhaps typical because there's hardly any action behind that. So. I had a question around what would you think the UK, what should the UK reaction be here? And what should be 
the societal or the community related reaction? What should it be here? And what in practical terms should we be doing to help our colleagues and comrades and friends in America, but also at the same time ensuring that this message of um, this message of um, standing up for the oppressed is actually is actually heard at the right levels and, and real action can happen. So just some ideas or concepts from you on that. Well, a, very, uh, a very beautiful uh, contribution. So many of them uh, this evening. I'm very impressed. And I'm sure the watching audience outside the party uh, will also be. Uh, it helps that you're all so wonderfully young. I must say, I, I feel like your grandfather uh, sitting here. Uh, it is uh, uh, an important question. Uh, and it brings me back to a point that I have already made, but need to make again. Uh, we don't believe in separatism. Uh, we don't believe that Muslims should separately organize against anti-Muslim discrimination. We don't believe that black people uh, should be separately organizing uh, against uh, racial oppression in Britain. We believe in uniting the maximum number of people against the real enemy. And the real enemy is the political class and their ideology. And the rest is just the consequence of uh, the political class and its ideology. Uh, in other words, uh, you're not going to, it's not that, you know, we wouldn't oppose, of course, uh, the reorganization of the London police force after the murder of Stephen Lawrence. We support it, uh, but we point out that it will not be sufficient. And if we had pointed it out, if we'd existed then, we'd have been proved amply uh, correct, wouldn't we? Uh, when uh, Jean-Charles de Menezes uh, was murdered uh, at Stockwell uh, on the underground, uh, we would have said uh, that uh, the police investigation of it uh, is not going to go uh, far enough uh, because it was a direct consequence of the atmosphere that existed in Britain at that time because of Britain's imperial role in the assault and destruction of Iraq. Uh, and we would have said that Cressida Dick should probably not be promoted uh, as a result of having overseen uh, the uh, execution of an entirely innocent man on the London Underground. And again, we would have been proved to be right uh, on that. So we, we do not, like some purist, uh, disdain to be involved in this issue or that issue, in this specific demand or that specific demand. We do get involved. Uh, we will join with these making these uh, demand, those making these demands. Uh, but we will, unlike others, point out uh, the extent to which these demands, this campaign is insufficient, uh, that it will not actually resolve uh, the problem that is being addressed because these problems are symptomatic of a deep cancer uh, in our society. And we want to cut that cancer out. And therefore we are involved in short term, uh, but also long term uh, politics. And the long term politics uh, will be much longer than I'll be around. And it will be people like you and the other uh, people who have spoken tonight from the party who will be taking those demands forward. Thank you, George. Um, next, we have a couple of questions uh, written in. Uh, first from Richard. Uh, I think we can take these ones together. So, oh, Richard has uh, sent in a question for his uh, friend Targreed. What is to stop the black population doing a modern version of the Selma to Montgomery march? It would take some of the wind out of the media sails, claiming they're violent thugs. And uh, Ian asks, given the past week's events and Trump's response, what distinguishes the Trump administration from being fascist? 
Uh, well, it will only be fascist when uh, there are no courts uh, prepared to take cases against the uh, abuse of power. It will only be fascist when all the newspapers wholly endorse uh, the activity of Trump, uh, which is the opposite, actually, of what we have today. It will only be fascist when elections are abolished and no possibility then exists uh, to vote Donald Trump out of office uh, when there are no elections for the Senate uh, in November. It will only be fascism uh, when uh, hundreds of thousands of people are being rounded up uh, uh, without uh, due process and taken to uh, camps. Uh, and it will only be fascist when uh, industrialized mass murder uh, begins to be the order of the day. So uh, it goes without saying, we are rather uh, a long way short uh, of that. I prefer to put it the way I did at the beginning, that all the conditions necessary for fascism in America are beginning to come together and in place. Uh, uh, a Mussolini type uh, president, a uh, kind of a Duce uh, figure, uh, a, a huge armed uh, and poor for the most part, working class uh, for the most part, uh, not just electoral base, uh, but a potential fighting base uh, for Trump. That's in place. Uh, the existence of uh, the sinews of the capitalist state uh, in the armed forces, in the uh, state level forces and in the police uh, forces uh, where are heavily present racist ideas and hatred against minorities uh, in the United States. That's all in place. And the power uh, that Trump declared yesterday that he had, which as a matter of fact, legal aid he does not have, uh, that also would be a precondition uh, for fascism. As to the first point, I've got to tell you that uh, somewhere yesterday, I think Philadelphia, but I may be mixing up the cities, uh, a very significant number of young people, white and black, did set off on a march, uh, and they were then trapped uh, on a highway siding and mercilessly bombarded with gas. Uh, so I think in the current atmosphere, if a mass march from Selma to Montgomery were to be announced today, it would be, that would not be the right place because, of course, uh, the situation is more problematic, uh, not in the South, but in the Midwest and in the North. Uh, but if a mass march uh, was planned, uh, there would be every possibility of it being ruthlessly attacked. And perhaps not only by the forces of the state, perhaps by some of these auxiliaries of which I have spoken this evening. Thank you, George. I think that account um, included the police firing on the protesters from one side and telling yeah. them to move back. And then when they moved back, they flanked them on the other side and started firing and the, from the other direction. They were literally uh, trapped. They were trapped. Uh, we have a question from Nadia. Go ahead, Nadia. Good evening, George. I hope all is well with you and Gayatri. Um, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering, you know, looking at America now and seeing all the um, all the protests, all the riots going on. I was just wondering, when is enough enough? I.e., when do you start realizing peaceful protest? It it doesn't work anymore. I mean, back when I was eleven years old, uh, I remember you on the TV protesting against the Iraq War, um, and I remember the the huge, huge, huge protest in London. But they still went to war. They still went to war. When do you have to escalate things? The brother of George Floyd, he asked for the rioting to stop and uh, to vote for, you know, the right person. But <laughs> will they ever allow the right person uh, to be a successful candidate? That's what I was wondering. Well, uh, in 1968, of course, uh, the Democrats had the 
clear intention uh, of picking uh, Bobby Kennedy as their candidate uh, to run for president uh, on a platform, a very radical platform by the standards of the time well to the left uh, of his brother Jack, uh, and he was uh, murdered. And the uh, chances uh, of, uh, of someone emerging from inside the political class that would uh, stop the drift to disaster uh, was cruelly cut short. And the Democrats fielded uh, a figure uh, who seemed ridiculous at the time, but compared with Joe Biden, uh, wasn't actually ridiculous at all. Hubert Humphrey, uh, who was soundly defeated by Richard Nixon, uh, and uh, everything that came after that, both for the people of Indochina and the people of America and people all around the world, in fact. Uh, so uh, we don't believe uh, that uh, from within the prevailing orthodoxy, any liberation is likely. And we, we reject the idea that we must choose uh, between one evil and another evil. Uh, that we must say that the left cheek of that arse is prettier than the right cheek. Uh, they are both part of an arse, and we have a responsibility to say that and to uh, put it that way and to offer uh, a distinct alternative, and we will continue to do that. Uh, as to enough is enough, well, enough will be enough when the mass of the people decide that it is enough. We can't decide that for them. Uh, we can't, you know, call a general strike uh, because the workers are not yet ready to follow us. Uh, we can't say that uh, an uprising needs to happen because uh, that would be uh, futile uh, because the balance of class forces, the balance of political forces uh, is nothing like, not remotely like, uh, being in our uh, favor. We have to concentrate on being right, on being the people who see things most clearly, uh, being the people who explain things most clearly, and projecting the way forward most clearly, and winning more and more working class people to our side. And here in parenthesis, I make this point because it keeps coming up. You don't have to be actually working uh, to be a member of the Workers' Party. You can be unemployed and be in the Workers' Party. You can be retired from working and be in the Workers' Party. Uh, you can be someone who's not yet old enough uh, to uh, work. You can be someone who's still in education. Uh, so we often get it, maybe it's disingenuous, but we often get it. But our, uh, our uh, task is to build mass political support uh, behind the program of the Workers' Party. Uh, there are uh, decades when nothing happens, and there are weeks when decades happen. Actually, I think these weeks are weeks in which decades are happening. Not just the situation in America, but the situation over the virus, uh, the pitiful uh, performance of our ruling class in the face of this devastating sickness, which has uh, descended uh, on our people, uh, which has beggared millions of our people, has killed, killed 65,000 of our people, killed by government incompetence, not only by a virus, but by government incompetence, by systemic incompetence. That's why I started out by saying 2020 uh, has already been one hell of a year, and I think it will be a transformative year. And uh, you never know. You see, I always make this point. Uh, if you knew what the last straw was, you wouldn't uh, lay it on the back of the camel. You only know that it was the last straw because the camel's back broke. Now, we cannot, we are not soothsayers. We cannot know when the last straw uh, for the mass of the people uh, will be so far as capitalism and imperialism is concerned. 
we have to be helping empower the working class with clear ideas and clear demands for when that day comes. Dan, I think that's probably us. If it is, I'm deeply grateful to all of you for a wonderful uh, meeting. Thanks very much indeed uh, for coming. And those watching on other platforms other than Zoom, please join us in the Workers' Party of Britain. I promise you, you won't regret it.